Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. Okay. Right now we are in a series called For the Love of Comfort and Joy. And I don't know, the team and I just were thinking about this season at the end of this year, at the end of last year. And I mean, if our own hearts are any indicator, we just sense that the community is craving some comfort and joy. Um, We wanted to talk about the holiday season in a way that wasn't just more hustle and bustle, but maybe it was a little bit of respite, a little bit of relief. Um, And for me, it definitely has been. So today we're looking back at 2021. We're talking about the big, beautiful, like hard year we've all had um, as we close out our 2021 holiday series for the love of comfort and joy. And this um, is a solo episode. This was my team's idea um, about coming to the podcast community and kind of just talking genuinely to you about my life and what 2021 has been like for me, what this last year has been like, what I've learned, um, where I am at now versus where I was on this day one year ago. And so I'm going to talk through some things with you, um, some things that I've been through and um, my highs of this year, my lows of this year, um, my regrets of this year, um, what I'm most thankful for, where I'm at spiritually, where's my faith at? What's that? What's that look like right now? All of it. It is a lot, right? To look back over the span of a whole year. I don't know. I don't know how you feel. If you feel like maybe it doesn't feel like a lot happened, or maybe you wish you had done more. Um, Maybe you wish you, maybe you did too much and you didn't slow down like you wanted to. Um, I mean, I remember, of course, when we were all happy that 2020 was over and that um, we were heading out of the pandemic and we had a different president in office and um, things just seemed to be looking up. I remember thinking that about this time last year, things seemed to be kind of looking up collectively. And then that didn't turn out the way we thought. Um, I mean, we're still here, you know, Um it's interesting kind of the way we carve out time and years, looking at our life through the seasons and how it makes us naturally and sometimes infuriatingly take stock. Right. Um, So for me, this time last year at the end of 2020, I was absolutely climbing out of the hole. I mean, I don't even know if I can really say I was climbing out of the hole. I was in the hole. I, um, um, I'd been alone with the kids in the house since July. So to me, July is when the July is the split for me in 2020, there's before July 11th. And then there was after July 11th. And so that was for me, the break. But at this time last year, I wasn't even officially divorced yet. I, um, was for all intents and purposes and, but you know, it wasn't even final. So I was, um, I was at the very beginning still of flying solo and starting those baby steps to find out who I was away from a 26 year marriage. I mean, my entire adult life. I mean, I got married when I wasn't even an adult, you know, I got married when I was 19. Um, and so I'd never even stood on my own adult legs. You know, I'd never even learned what it meant to be Jen and who am I and what do I want out of life and what am I good at? And um, I didn't have any time to build in broader experiences or a wider worldview. I didn't go anywhere. I didn't see anything. I didn't, I didn't experience anything new. I just funneled right into the script that had always been written for me. 
And I didn't even have the imagination to imagine something differently, to be honest with you. I, at the time, I wouldn't have said at all that I was missing out or that I was rushing adulthood or, um, but I was, I was, and, um, it's a, it's a tricky needle to thread, to be honest with you. And I don't even really know how to talk about it because like, it's not regret, right? Oh, sorry. I, I couldn't possibly like regret my life. I've, um, cause then I'd have to regret everything that came with it. I'd have to regret the kids and <laughs> the, you know, friends along the way and just everything there. I don't, I can't, there isn't a life outside of what I chose. I, I, I can't even think of what it would be. So it's not that it's regret, but I do look back on that, like 18 year old girl, 19 year old bride. And I like have such compassion for her just doing the thing that she thought she was supposed to do. And, um, playing the role that the only role I thought I had available to me and then just building a life there. Um, oh God, I wish I had enough. I'm having a hard time with music right now, but my friend Amy came over. I'm going to talk about her a little bit later in the episode actually, but she came over a couple of weeks ago and we were sitting on the porch and she's like, have you listened to the new Adele album? I'm like I can't. Like, I just can't do it. I love myself. <laughs> I, I am tender right now and I'm hurting and I just don't feel like I can do it. She's like, I do want to play you one song. And she goes, every time I hear it, I think about you. And she played Adele's um, Go Easy on Me. <laughs> oh, gosh. I mean, we just sat there with tears, like pouring down both of our faces. And she's got some lyrics. I'm going to get them a little bit wrong. I should have looked this up before I started, but it was something like... Um, I was just a child. Like I didn't even have time to learn the world. <laughs> no, go easy on me. It's a divorce song. Oh, it gives me such like compassion for myself. And um, knowing that even five years later, I would have been a different version of me, a more grown version of me. Uh, I don't know. Um, so last year at this time, those were all the thoughts like swirling around my life and and I was learning at 46, some things that I should have learned back then. Right. Um, about myself, about the world, about life, about standing in my own two feet. So I was finding a lot of healing and solace in my friends, in my family, um, in therapy, obviously. And there was a lot of like firsts and all that. And um, I had to really battle some shame around that, particularly when it came to like some adult stuff that I just should have already had in hand that felt um, like neglectful and even immature that I had abdicated. I just handed that over and um, neglected to really grow up in some areas of my life that like a lot of this was around money. You kind of watched me take charge of my finances last year um, and really finally put um, put my financial life in order, get getting in front of it, like steering the, steering the ship was very, very empowering. Um, but there was like a shame kind of baked into it that I had to keep, um, pressing down, um, that I didn't really know, you know, I didn't know how much money I made. I didn't know how much money was coming and going. I didn't know what retirement looked like or was going to look like. I mean, I just, it was all such a new thing for me. Um, among a million other things, like last year was the first time that I parented all by myself ever. Like, and we have five kids. It's a lot. And yes, they're young adults and upper teens, but listen, anybody who has kids that age, you know, they need you then that it's not, you're not done. You're not done at this recording. Four of the five of them live here and half. So uh, it's not as if, um, parenting hasn't been a heavy lift and just doing it by myself was, and is one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, I was the main bill payer and shuttle driver and child comforter and house maintainer. And it was just a lot. 
Um, some of it, I did sleepwalking. <laughs> I can see it in my face. When I look at posts from a year ago, again, like I could cry over it. Cause I feel so um, tender toward myself. I was trying as hard as I could. And so determined to see my little family through this. And um, while hurting so much, like just being absolutely broken open, broken hearted, um, traumatized, honestly. And I, I just, um, I was doing some powering through at this time last year. Um, and I don't begrudge myself that, but, oh man, was it hard. And I can see it when I look backward the exhaustion and the sadness behind my eyes as I was doing the all out work. I mean, absolutely all out um, putting on a smile as often as I could while alternatively having the weight of it all just knock me out. Um, and you can see, I think one thing that I'm thankful for and I'm proud of is that I didn't necessarily hide that from you. I, I talked pretty openly about grief and loss and therapy and pain and what I was learning and codependency. I, I just decided that I needed to have all those pieces on the table um, to become whole and to really steer into recovery and um, that I couldn't have a separate version of me doing the, a tap dance publicly while the real me was just swimming upstream. And so I do, I, what you saw was genuine and I'm glad for that. Um, I didn't know what it was going to feel like or be like to suffer publicly. Like I did um, to be transparent about that. Um, but the community was more, than I could have ever imagined. Like, a lot of us just suffered together. Like we, our pain art together. And I found a real soft place to land inside our community. And I'll never, I'll be grateful for it for as long as I live. The um, kindness and the generosity and compassion that came back to me during that season. Um, and so here it is like a year later, essentially I've been on my own for a year and a half, which like alternatively isn't that long. And it's also so long. Like, I don't know which it is. I think it's both. Um, but when I look at my little family, I'm like, oh gosh, we made it through the year of firsts. Anybody who's had a traumatic life change, you know what I mean by that? We made it through all of our first birthdays after the, after the parting of our family, all of the first holidays, the first Christmas, um, the first family vacation with just six of us, um, everything. I'm so happy to have every one of those firsts in my rearview mirror. They would come and I could feel my body like getting ready for it. I just kind of bracing for an, a rhythm that I'd never experienced, an alternative, an alternative reality than anything I've literally ever known. Um, and so we got through them all. We made it. <laughs> we made it through those hellish first months, that hellish first year. Um we worked on our grief, not just me, the kids, the kids were in therapy. Golly, we lifted every heavy burden we could together. And Carissa, my therapist really taught me how to suffer with the kids, not necessarily for them. Does that make sense? Cause I mean, I, I hardcore, I'm a fixer just by nature. I'm a, I'm an Enneagram three. So I'm like, what's the solution? right? Like, let's just get to the resolution here. What let's not talk. Um, and there isn't actually a solution to suffering. 
there isn't a solution when one of your parents leaves, you know, that doesn't, that can't be fixed. And so Carissa taught me how to suffer with my kids without any instinct to fix it or smooth it out for them or hustle it along. And went against like every fiber in my being to do that. But um, I'm grateful for it now when I look back on my relationship with the kids and how many times I can't even count that we just sat together in tears. And all I could say to them was like, I know I feel the same way. And I am so sorry that this is happening. And I wish this wasn't true. And I wish we had a different experience. And your pain is nor- your pain is normal and you should be expected to feel it. And you can feel it as long and as deep as you need to. Um, and something about that permission gave our family, me and the kids, the runway to climb out. Um, cause there wasn't any pressure on it. I refused to put pressure on the kids to feel better, to have any sort of, um, like reconciliation. Um, I wasn't going to hustle that at all. Like, and, and all of them have gone at their own pace at that, by the way. Um, and then I'm like, okay, who are we? We're still whole people. I'm a whole woman and I'm not, I wasn't just a wife ever. Like however much that bit of my identity felt um, like the hugest slice of the pie, it really wasn't. Um, There's always more to me than that. And so who, who, what was left, right? That was the work. Who, Who am I with that slice gone? What's, what's here, you know? Um, and that has been the work of my lifetime. I'm so interested right now in elevating and celebrating good things. So community, I'd like to introduce you to Abel. If you're not familiar with Abel, they are an ethical fashion brand that employs and empowers women as a solution to end poverty. <laughs> Love. They're deeply devoted also to quality, both in the products they make and in the quality of life they aim to provide. So they invest in, train, and educate women so they can earn a living, break the cycle of poverty, and thrive. And would you believe it all started with scarves for them in Ethiopia? They met women coming out of the commercial sex industry who asked for help finding jobs. So they trained them to make scarves. And after selling over 4,000 of them in two months, they knew they were onto something. And now Abel has grown from hand-woven scarves to a whole lifestyle brand with leather bags and clothes, shoes, jewelry, and more. I have so much of their stuff that I wear on constant rotation. I cannot say enough good things about Abel. Truly, come check them out for the cause and their incredible business practices and stay for the fashion. You can get 20% off site-wide with my code 20GIN at livefashionable.com. So that's 20GIN at livefashionable.com. My friend, Amy, that I just mentioned, who made me listen to Go Easy on Me by Adele, that's the meanest thing in the world. Do not play that for a 19-year-old bride who lost her marriage. It's so terrible. Uh, and I was just hurting for love this year too. And so all, it just, it hit a bruise that was so tender. Um, but she said something to me, and I mentioned this on social media. You can go back and see the post, but I, she said, Jen, she texted me about three or four days after we'd spent three hours on the porch together. And she's known me for 15 years. So we know each other. Well, like we've been through a million things together. And she said, I, um, you've never been more you like, this is the most you I've ever seen you be. You are, you're not hiding. You're not deflecting essentially. You're not. And I do that. That's my, that was my old way, um, which was the, everything is fine way. You know what I mean? Everything is fine. I'm fine. Um, I'm strong, uh, enough about me. How about you? Um, 
I don't, I've always struggled with vulnerability. That's just a thing that is hard for me. And it feels um, risky. Like it feels so risky to be vulnerable with somebody to like hand them your heart, to hand them your, your soul. Cause they could just walk away. Right. They could just mistreat it and they could, um, and do that happens. Uh, and so I've always been on guard against that. And, um, just this had this sense in the world that I need to protect my own self. I kind of laid that down this year for better, for worse, honestly. Um, and so when she's like, you're the most you've ever been, I'm like, I am like, this is the most me I am. I am telling the truth. I am, I'm risking loss and exposure. I'm, um, I'm just like open-handed toward life in a way that all my self-protective measures don't have a say anymore. And so, um, it was weird this year because, um, you know, I, I released a book, I released fierce in April, fierce, free and full of fire. And it's really strange to have written a book that is the most reflective of your most evolved self. I mean, everything is in that book that is the most true about me. My, my most evolved convictions, um, the best version of my leadership, my strongest sense of self and, um, that's like, that was the outer reach of Jen. And then just three months after it released in April, everything changed. It's such a weird thing to have happened in 2021. Um, like just, or that was in 2020, I should say, just drastic, like seismic changes about my life. And um, I, I couldn't go back to be honest with you. I said this last year, but after July 11th, I was like, I can't read fierce. I I don't even want to open it up. I don't remember what I said. I don't know if it's still true. I don't know if anything I said will hold. I can't remember what I was thinking uh, because I was just in such a brain fog. Trauma will do that to you and loss and everything was so discombobulated in my life. And I'm like, I just can't read it. I'm I'm afraid that I'll not be able to stand by it. Um, Or worse that whatever I wrote could only be true when your life is intact. Right. So probably sometime in, I don't even know, September or October of last fall, I, I'm like, I got to just see if I can stand by this project. And I opened it up and I remember just having like waves of relief wash over me. It was just all still true and all still real. And it was all in there. It's like I had written words for myself that I needed now. I'd written words of strength and generosity and healing and compassion and, and belonging to your own self, come what may. Like whatever goes sideways or whatever you lose, you have you. And I couldn't find a single word that I was unwilling to stand by. And that was such a relief um, that I was in there. Like I was in there. And, and then I even feel um, I read those words that I wrote and thought, Jen, you are on the precipice of becoming even more this, even more you. Would I have chosen the story? Of course not. Um, the path, no, but, but I was there. I'm not a different me. It is, it's not like it's a wholesale different person. I, um, was so relieved to see myself in my own words, both before and after. So last year I wrote this excerpt from, um, fierce and I put it on my Instagram feed and it was like, what the heck? Because I wrote, this is what I wrote. I want to be free. 
I will dedicate 0% of my beautiful life to fury, resentment, bitterness, and regret. I just won't. I'm better than that. And so are you. I want these types of yeses to rule my life. Listen, it's not that we don't have good reasons to cling to anger and all that comes with it, but that is just one more way to give our own power away. So I made a decision super early that anger, bitterness, and resentment were not going to rule the day for me. They just weren't. It's not even my way. I mean, you guys know me. I, that's not my, that is not my way. I'm, I'm all heart, right? And I'm, I knew I wasn't going to go down with that. I even knew from the very beginning, like this isn't, I'd never be like a woman scorned, you know, or some vicious version of myself. I don't even have that. I don't even have that. So um, I think that was one of my early levers that I pulled that made a huge difference um, in my recovery process. Um, And then here in the show, we just built out a year of interviews for this last calendar year that have been so, I mean, probably the best we've ever done. Like such incredible guests this year that have taught me so much. I mean, did I practically bend the um, trajectory of the show around what I needed? Yeah. And like, (laughs) we brought in the experts I wanted to hear from, and they spoke to me as if I was the only listener. And I learned so much from them. And I I assimilated what they were teaching us as a listening community into my own personal story. And it's meant, it meant everything to me. I mean, we had Dr. Shafali. That was an incredible interview. Um, Nedra Tawab, Jen Garner was on the show twice, Bishop Curry. And I cried through the whole thing. Um, and then there were just some that like brought joy to my heart because I was really determined to laugh again, determined, um, to have joy and happiness in my life. I mean, I had Chris Jackson, you know, who was the original George Washington in Hamilton. I loved that interview. Um, Trisha Yearwood, the one person that I have wanted to have on the show for so long and just delightful, like so much delight this year in addition to growth. Um, and it just breathed life into me. And I'm like, I'm coming back. Like I am, I am recovering. I felt it. Like I felt it in my bones. I am, I'm returning to myself really for the truest, the truest sense of me ever. And I'm smiling again, again, and I'm laughing again, and I have hope again, and I have joy again. And, um, the sun really broke through this year. It, bro- it broke through the clouds. Um, I feel like the, um, ec- the, the culmination of that for me, and you would probably not be surprised to hear me say this if you were watching, um, going along with me in real time, but um, I took a solo trip to Maine, to Bar Harbor, Maine over the summer. I was there for three weeks, mostly by myself. And it was it was like life giving. It was me living. It's what it was living again. And, um, and on my own, like I'm a whole, I'm a whole person. I, um, I can travel alone. I can live. I can live like I can live and I'm living. Um, it was the most incredible time. I called it me camp. That's why I'm wearing this hat. I called it me camp. And, um, it was while Remy was at camp. Remy was at camp for a month in Maine. And that's why I chose Maine. Everybody was like, what the heck? Um, Remy and I kind of fell apart at the same time last year. Our little fragile hearts just gave out. And, um, so camp was for her part of her recovery process to be in a wholesome, incredible environment for four weeks without any screens, you know, just activity and outdoors from morning till night and camp gave Remy her life back. And so did mine. So I told her I am going to go be in Maine for the same amount of time you are. I, 
I hadn't even booked anything at that point. I'm like, I want you to know that I'll be near. Um, if you need me, I, I will get in my car and I will be there. I just wanted this sort of emotional safety net around her while she did something so big and a little bit scary, especially when she was in such a fragile space. Um, and so I'm like, I don't know where I'm going to be, but I'll just be in the same state as you. So don't be afraid. Know that I'll be physically near you if you need me. And then I get on Google. Where am I going to go? I don't even know. Um, this was all like in April, <laughs> maybe May even. And pulled it together. And that's why I went to me to be near Remy if she needed me, which she did not. Um, and I just felt some of the doubts fall away there. Like I'm going to be okay. I had my very first date in Maine since 1992, my very first kiss. And I was like, ah, this is still alive in me. Like not just alive in me. This is my, this is my, I have nothing but possibility in front of me. Right. Um, I'm built, I'm built for love I'm built for connection. And I didn't fall in love. Don't worry. Everybody calm down. It was one date. It's just calm down, but it was enough to be like, Oh, Oh my God, there I am. That part of me too. You know, that part of me too. And that's really been awakened in me this year. Um, and is, is thrilling, actually thrilling just to know that, um, I'm going to have like an incredible future and I feel really excited about that and what might love look like for me and, um, what I'm capable of and that I'm worthy of it. Honestly, that I deserve it. I deserve to be cherished and loved. And I deserve to be someone's like favorite person, you know, (laughs) Is that sentimental? I just do. And um, so that feels like an exciting part of my future and my near future. I think that's my guess. That's my, that's my guess. Um, I'm going to enjoy the process of finding out though. I'll tell you that much. Um, So my encouragement to you is just keep going, like keep doing the work. I gave myself a lot of time to do all that work and, um, without any sort of emotional side exit door, you know, or I didn't anesthetize it at all. I didn't numb it with, um, some shiny new thing or any of that. I just was sat in it for as long as I needed to. And so keep going, um, keep slogging, keep moving forward by the half inch. If that is you. Um, keep, keep chasing you in your own, like flourishing, however long it takes. And I'm sorry to tell you that none of it can be short circuited or fast forwarded. There is no way around it. It is only through it. I swear, please trust me avoiding it. None of that works. It just doesn't it. I mean, you can, but it will come back. So you deal with it now or deal with it later. Once you've like made a mess of everything, <laughs> right. Um, deal with it now, like deal with it now so that you emerge. And that's what happens. You emerge, you come out on the other side and there you are. Like my friend said, the most you you've ever been. I look forward to that for you. I mean, and I'll just tell you for me, it's worth every tear. It's worth every therapy appointment. Um, it's worth every misstep and every uncomfortable growth and pain point, all worth it. Um, It's like a miracle. Guys, as we wrap up the year 2021 here, there is much to be reflected on and learned from. For those of us with kids, I think one of the things the last year, really two years, has taught us is that school has been extra hard. From the virtual settings we dealt with initially to the whiplash of back and forth, the roller coaster of feelings, and maybe we're still navigating some of all that. But here's the thing, even in the best of circumstances and best of schools, your child probably isn't getting the one-on-one teaching they need to really reach their full potential. That's why I love what Byju's Future School is doing. At Byju's, students receive 
personalized attention and a world-class learning experience that's completely online, all in service of supplementing their in-person school education. Byju's has small group and one-on-one learning sessions and are committed to helping students become creators and build skills they'll actually use for the rest of their lives while sparking a lifelong love of learning. I love it. This is just so critical for our next generation. Byju's Future School currently offers coding and music courses for grades one through 12 and math courses for grades one through eight. It's tons of fun, along with being so relevant to our world today. Among many things, kids learn about the technology that makes modern games, apps, cryptocurrencies possible, which is amazing, right? Definitely goes beyond normal school curriculum. So join the millions of parents accelerating their kids' learning today. Your child can build their own Minecraft character in the first four weeks. So visit buyjuice.com slash US to enroll in your first four classes. This is a $99 value for just $9.99. So that's four classes for just $9.99 at B-Y-J-U-S dot com slash us community a ton of you followed along my me camp solo trip in maine last summer that trip was transformative in so many ways but it actually birthed what i'm so so excited to be talking about with you right now it's something i'm calling the me course series It's an e-course series, but it is for you, sisters. Our mission here is simple. This is inspirational, educational, and actionable content. As I like to say, for the rest of us. Okay? It's not like heady, graduate-level work. It's not going to take a billion hours. But it is what we all need so that you and I can show up better in our lives. I'll be joined by experts in every category where I've seen the most life change in myself and in others. We serve up tons of practical life-changing action steps without you needing to commit hours upon hours and upon hours of your time because you don't have it. Neither do I. So here's a quick overview of the three courses available right now. First, simplicity, clearing out the head trash. Don't we all need this six ways from Sunday? We cover external and internal here, both your physical spaces and your mental, soul, and emotional spaces, all right? Next, finances, that F word we all love to ignore or hate, but that we need to learn. This is, y'all, jam-packed with an A to Z of what anyone and everyone needs to know and do with money. Finally, we talk wellness as it relates to us building good habits that serve us so well and end up serving the people that we love, the work that we love. This is so important across every category. I I literally cannot wait for all of us to learn together. So register now at mecourse.org and use the code for the love to save $10 off already discounted pricing. So head over to mecourse.org and let's do this. So for those of you watching this um, record, watching this episode over on YouTube, um, I just left for two hours, clearly got my hair done, and now I'm back. So same me, same day, done hair. Okay, picking right back up where I was. I wonder, because some of you guys asked me this, and so I wanted to include it in this episode. Like after all this, Like not just after this last year and really for me a year and a half or more even, what is the deal with me and God? Like, um, where are we at? What's that like? So anyone who's ever gone through something devastating or like life altering, you know, where every single thing in your life comes up for question. 
um, sometimes that means that you don't just question things about who you are or who you've been or um, who you are going to become, um, but maybe also the elements of your faith that brought you this far, right? Um, and I think that's a good question. And I think it's something that I've definitely asked. Now, it's no mystery. It's no surprise that my faith has And this is a good thing. It's evolved and it has shifted and changed as I've gotten older and had greater exposure to the world and to people and to different perspectives and different um, theology and doctrines and um, just kind of even different bodies of theological work. I'm having only really digested a very small percentage um, of like theological interpretation most of my life. And so I actually, it's a great thing when our faith is evolving, shouldn't it? Shouldn't it? If it looks exactly like it looked 10 years ago, I think we're doing something wrong. Um, and there's a lot of scripture that makes it pretty clear that there's, there's a lot to press on. And as we should, that sometimes the packaging around faith um, outgrows itself. It outgrows its generation. It outgrows its contextual usefulness. I think that's why Jesus told that story about the wineskins. They have a limit. They can stretch so far. It doesn't change the wine, but it changes the container. And that's definitely been true for me. You know, obviously when I grew up and I grew up Southern Baptist, I clearly thought that I was going to be, I was a one and done on marriage for sure. Like my parents, um, one highlight of this year was going to Costa Rica with all five of my kids and all my sibs and our entire extended family to celebrate my parents' 50th anniversary. It's a pretty big deal. And I thought that was going to be me. Um, I definitely grew up believing that divorce was wrong. Now, I, most of the church has sort of evolved on this by now, but I mean, I grew up in the church in the eighties. And so that was like disqualifying. I mean, I can remember, um, deacons and staff members being either fired or, um, removed from their position because they went through a divorce. So I definitely believe that. And that at the, at best, it would render me such a disappointment to God, such a failure um, that I, I don't know how I would go on. You know, just somebody like me who has always loved to please, um, which is a, this is the dark side of an Enneagram three, which is the need for approval. And that, that applied to my relationship with God for half my life. Um, that really, I just wanted his approval and it was to be, to put a finer point on it, I was terrified of his disapproval. Um, and divorce would have put me solidly in that camp for sure. Um, and so, you know, I came up through this conventional, traditional spiritual space, and I knew every mark to hit. I mean, it was my native tongue. There was no way that I did not understand the language, the rules, the boundaries, the borders. Um, I knew how to be, I knew how to garner favor inside that community. And I was good at it, super type A in that way. And um, incredibly principled, which I still am now. Um, That's just now shifted into a different um, way of using my convictions. Um, But so, you know, I came up writing like what would be considered traditional Bible studies, um, very conventional points of view, gendered, um, patriarchal. I didn't even know I have that word in hand back then. Um, I was doing the best I had with what I knew. Um, but you know, I was giving out all sorts of godly advice or whatever you want to call it. Like when I was 30 (laughs) and, you know, sort of training up students and then shortly thereafter women and, uh, you know, it's tempting for me to just absolutely die over this, to just cringe endlessly at some of the things I said back then, what I believed, how I instructed other people to, to conduct their lives, what I thought God was like. Um, you know, I had a lot of influences over me and I was involved in this massive culture that just sort of swept me along with it. And, um, and of course, there are a lot of reasons that certain ways of believing and thinking served us inside of our communities and, and that are all true, still true. It's not as if 
it's like a carte blanche sea change here. It's not like everything that ever used to have meaning to me inside of faith is gone. And now it's a whole completely different set. That's not true. There's still a lot of crossover and a lot of through lines, um, you know, carry forward. Of course it did. Um, but I'm, I'm, it's tempting to cringe, but I'm not going to do it because it's kind of what I said at the top of the show. It's the same reason I refuse to regret my marriage. You know, I, I, there isn't a story without it. Like I, the faith that was handed to me, the faith that, that raised me really, um, and that launched me as an adult is largely responsible for shaping my convictions and, um, my sense of God's presence in the world. And, um, I, I'm, I don't regret it. Every single bit of like, just like hard fought experience and every question that I wrestled through every issue that I just grappled with, I mean, grappled um, intellectually, spiritually, all the disappointments, the, the many, many, many times we were not just let down by spiritual leaders, but shattered by them, right? Um, betrayal and rejection inside, you know, that ecosystem, all of that made me who I am today. And it's given me a perspective that I use constantly. Like it, it really has. And it's, it's, it's served me. It has served me as a leader. Um, It's, it's fundamentally affected the way I think about people, the way I think about justice, what I think the role of the church should be um, in our culture and in our world and what I think it shouldn't be. Um, I needed all that in my life and I'm grateful for it. And I still have heroes, heroes, of the faith inside some of those conventional structures that I cherish and um, listen to, and they mentor me. So I don't want you to hear me say it was all this and now it's all that, because that's just not true. That's not true. And some of my favorite people in the world um, are still flourish in that construct. And that gives me joy. I mean, I'm wherever people can flourish in their faith, I'm happy about it. And I, I'm not nearly arrogant enough to know that there's a one size fits all here. Of course there isn't. Um, but I can tell you like where I'm at personally, um, God is still here with me and me with him, um, through the wild shifts and the, that the last, you know, 47 years have brought, he is here. That's never felt in question to me. God's like presence, his nearness to me. Um, I've already done the hard work of unlearning that God is just tolerating me and relearning that he loves me. That's that work I did a few years ago. And so I got to lay down the punitive, very arbitrary, terrifying wrath God that I was raised with. And I already, I already have have come to understand that we are so deeply loved by God, like well beyond what makes any sense to us and not in a human way of understanding love, um, which of course comes with trap doors and um, caveats and exceptions and, you know, it's not like that. Um, And so when my life fell apart last year, I never felt like at any point I was going to slip out of God's hand or out of his favor or um, out of his love. And the opposite was true. I, I couldn't even pray for a while. I, I just couldn't pray. All those words felt so stale and formulaic. And um, because I had applied them in a different context, uh, the context of being in an intact life, right? Some of those prayers come really easy when everything's going great. And so I couldn't just lift them up and drop them in to a newer context. It just felt um, manufactured to me. So I didn't even really have prayer words. Um, And I found that I didn't need them. I didn't have to beg God to be near me. I didn't have to plead for his comfort, um, for his protection, um, for his continued presence in my life. I didn't have to ask for any of that. It just was, 
It just was what it was. Um, he was there. He was never not going to be there. And so this sense that I maybe used to have of essentially having to beg God for his intervention in my life, I just didn't have. And so I'd sit on the porch kind of just in stillness and in quiet and um, let God just be near me. And so I think where I'm at now is that um, I, the older I get, I know less and less and less about God. I'm less sure about anything, um, less sure about how it all works out, less sure about what eternity means. I don't even know. I, I, I know less as the years go by, but what I do know more is that I believe that this absolute center spoke of the wheel for God is love. And that includes us all. I just know it. I know that it does. And, um, I don't believe that God has these tricky rules, this needle to thread that our human, not just minds, but experiences, location, geography, um, circumstances have to all line up in this perfect order for us to ever even conclude. I just don't believe that that's how God works. That's mean. That's, that's like a monster. Um, that you really have to be born into a degree of what we would consider privilege um, in every way to find God in this narrow way that we suggested is the only way. I just think God loves the world more than we can ever comprehend. And he has made himself known in it since the beginning of time in ways that we can't even fathom. I mentioned it earlier. He did Harry and Megan's wedding and he's impossibly special. Like, just so special. And he spoke this benediction over us and this prayer and this lament and this sort of hope for the future. And I cried you guys the whole time. I, I started crying during the first answer he gave me. And I don't think I ever quit. I was really tender when we did that show. And um, I just find that I lean right now spiritually toward people and places that are deeply humble, deeply humble. Humility is a huge priority. The lack of humility is my first red flag. Arrogance, self-righteousness, um, a sense of entitlement um, and self-preservation. Uh, that's my biggest. So I, I really lean toward people that are humble, that are curious, that hold people with very loving hands and that definitely um, throw their weight and attention and influence and favor behind people who are marginalized, um, which is exactly what Jesus always said. It's the entire scope of the Bible. The entire scope of the Bible is from the margins. And so when a perspective that I hear is from the center of the bullseye, from its, when it's from a place of power, and privilege and position and dominance. It's every red flag for me. And so that's one of that's, I guess that's sort of my North star spiritually right now, which is um, what feels true, true. What is, what it's, what has at its beating core love, what is deeply humble, um, what prioritizes curiosity and connection over certainty. Um, and where's their life? Where is their life? And if a spiritual environment in any way is producing death and sorrow and pain and exclusion and suffering, it's just not of God. And so this has been a really good metric for me as I move forward in faith at this age and reach for what I think is holy and healthy and good for the world. Um, it's a discerning tool for me. So my hopes for this next year are that we find ourselves. I'm going to repeat something Bishop Curry said in his episode and it sounds flat on its face, but he said, I wish for all people in 2022 happiness. And I don't think that's trite. Um, if you look at the way God told us to live, which includes things like, um, generosity and compassion and, um, neighborliness, love, forgiveness, um, humility, all these things, if we lived 
by the fruits of the spirit, we would be happy. Like that would be a natural outcome of playing by the rule book God handed us. It would, it would increase our happiness a billion fold. Um, we would be in right relationship with one another. We would be um, good neighbors. We would care about those who are being left behind or pushed down to the bottom of the pile. Um, we would have an equitable culture, an equitable community. It just it would indeed produce happiness. And so that's my wish for us, whatever that looks like. If that means we lay down something, we lay down some bitterness and resentment this year. If it means we pick up love and possibility this year, I'm hoping that for me, I hope 2020 for me brings love. So there you've heard me say it. And I um, am ready and excited for what my future is. And I think this is the best me I've ever been. And that excites me too. Um, and I hope for happiness for the people that I love, that there is more fairness, more joy, more peace, more patience in all of our lives, the things that genuinely produce joy. So, I mean, 2020 and 2021 by all the way by not going to miss either of you. Um, you produced a lot of sorrow and a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm, <laughs> we said this last year when 2021 came around, but genuinely hoping that 2022 turns a page. Um, and I look forward to it. I think I do. I was not looking forward to this year when I hit January 1st of 2021. I was still too neck deep in it. Everything was still too acute, still too painful, still too confusing. I wasn't even divorced yet. Um, so no, I was not looking forward to this year. It just felt like more hard, but I am looking forward to next year. I am. Um, I'm grateful for everything that pain has taught me. I'm grateful for the teacher that suffering turned out to be in 2021, that rebuilding turned out to be golly, what a teacher. It has been um, to relearn, to rebuild, to recover, um, and just to see all that's been redeemed. I love this community so much, and we have so many incredible plans for the, this podcast in 2022. Incredible. As always, it is our single aim to serve you well, um, to bring you leaders and thinkers and teachers um, of the highest caliber who are daily improving us. Um, teaching us, stretching us, challenging us, um, helping us grow, helping us release. Um, we, that's, we've got so much, in the, so much in the hopper for you. So thank you for yet another incredible year on this show. Um, what a joy it has been for us as we steer into the fifth year of, this, of the podcast. I cannot, I cannot believe it. Um, 35 million downloads. What a what in the world? Um, one of the greatest things I've ever been a part of. So, so farewell, 2021. We bid 2022 hello. Um, we welcome it with open arms. Let's see what she has to teach us. Let's see what she has to hand us. Um, let's go into it with joy and curiosity and humility. And I hope it's our best year yet. With all my love, to you all my gratitude to you thanks you guys thanks for being a part of this community